So hello, Adam Bin here and welcome to the 37th edition of AirHacks TV. Lots of questions. So and the most questions I got in the last, last, last 12 hours. So at the beginning I thought, okay, there will be just you no know, five, seven questions. And right now we have, I think, almost 20. So let's start with the topics. So um, first, tomorrow we have the next bunch of uh, AirHacks TV. So um, AirHacks TV, AirHacks.com workshop at Munich Airport. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to this. And uh, what we will do, we start with architectures and microservices, and I particularly are looking forward to the performance troubleshooting and monitoring, like hands-on what happens behind the scenes on application server, like threading, performance tuning, troubleshooting, uh, memo leaks, whatever you like to hear, no transaction timeout, uh, whatever is useful to, um, to the uh, firefighters work in our task forces. What I'm also looking uh, uh, forward to is to the next bunch of workshops. Why? Uh, three weeks ago, we had the JavaScript workshops at Munich Airport, and there are some attendees which attended Web Standards, where I hacked a um, HTML5 app without any any frameworks and a little bit Polymer at the end, 2.0, and then React and Angular. And the first time ever, uh, React and Web Standards were uh, more popular than Angular 2 or Angular 4, uh, which is actually not a surprise. And um, I think no one who attended all three days uh, really liked Angular better than the other frameworks, which is um, interesting. And uh, I will repeat the um, the uh, workshops from uh, the uh, architectures, microservices, and performance in I think December. Okay, very first question. Uh, good one. So, uh, what's the question about? Imagine we have a master data and how to synchronize. Uh, or the question: What would be the killer killer protocol? Uh, for uh, data replications between uh, for for master data data replication, so WebSockets, uh, GMS, or other technologies like Apache Kafka. So, um, so you know how to tackle the problem. So th first, I would, I would I would like to think you know what would be the ultimate technology, and the ultimate technology is something which um, the database already using, for instance, NoSQL database, they replicate all the data behind the scenes. And they call the protocol gossip. So look at that. It will be uh, the most sophisticated master data replication ever. So, um, and what would be the second choice? The second choice, right from the technology perspective, is would be a WebSockets. You standardized. You could um, monitor it with uh, JavaScript. And GMS is actually not standardized. And I would only use GMS in microservices in case I don't have to scale the GMS server, which could be pretty hard. Pretty hard. And Apache Kafka is a special case, and to set up Apache Kafka, you will have to set up Zookeeper, and uh, it is, uh, I would say, as painful as uh, g well, painful, as complicated as a GMS server. So first, but I think the the main issue here is, um, you know, um, so. WebSockets is not a reliable protocol, of course, so the, the messages can get lost. So I ask myself, you know, uh, what is the idea behind the synchronization? And what you should do first is to think about the business logic. So, um, you know, what is the business case here and how to identify duplicates, how to, you know, uh, resend the data. So I think I will uh, think about the use case and try to implement the uh, replication in an idempotent way. So what it means if the node sends the data twice, you, you don't get duplicates on the other side. But WebSocket seems reasonable to me. JaxRS as well. JMS is not a protocol, but if uh, you know you have um, all application servers have the same version, then JMS could be also a an, an, an viable option if you have already a um, centralized JMS server. And Kafka is a special solution. So I hope we answer the first question. So let's see what happens in this chat. So chat just listens. Uh, Twitter is quiet. Very good. So, from Jerry, and I think I know Jerry. So I met him at uh, there was a uh, conference in Denmark. Uh, it was called JDK IO or something like this. So I met him the first time. So we have a JaxRS. So create 201, read 200, update 204, delete is not important. So and uh, uh, he would like to use this core support for JaxRS Java 7. And what he says is um, uh, he would like to have uh, authentication token. And Jerry is absolutely right. So if so, how it works, the course protocol, what is course? Course is cross-origin resource sharing, and you need course if you would like to communicate from your browser with other servers, 
than you than you were loaded from. So if I have server A and all my resources are loaded from server A, and I would like to communicate with server B, the server B has to be set up with a course filter. And the problem, the challenge here, the course uh, filter only works properly, my course filter works properly without authentication. If I would like to use authentication, I will have to have um, to expose, expose access control access control expose headers. So I will have to allow this and I will have to hard code or hard code to configure the origin. And I could do this. So how I, how how do you handle the situation in your project? I actually implement this. I expose uh, access control expose headers and I uh, I configure the origin. And if you go, hopefully it points to my project here. Yeah? Exactly. And uh, if you if you look at the source code, it is really Java E ish. <laughs> Why? It's a single class with 70 lines of code. So what you have to do is you will have to put the header here, and you 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 are not allowed then to say access control uh, allow origin asterisk. You have to be more specific and say okay, uh, I allow it from the server. So this is what has to be done, and. Um, I guess I could, if I find some time, I'm working on something more exciting right now, but if I find some time, I will enhance this class and, and deploy, I think, this 03 version. So, Jerry, thank you for attending the conference and, of course, now for the question. So, where is Jerry? Here. Uh, first of all, thank you for your great blog. Uh, thank you for reading my blog and listening to, to Airhex TV, of course. Um, by the way, I really enjoy the Airhex TV. So meanwhile, I, I meet people at conferences and the uh, and they point me to the uh, Airhex TV. And uh, yeah, it's a nice community in the chat. So they come from all over the world. So uh, thank you for watching. And um, we have uh, three years and one month already in the in the queue uh, or in archives. So we have a Java e application that uses basic basic authentication. So in WebXML. So and now. Uh, uh, Pad would like to expose some logic through REST web service to access via mobile client. H how can we implement token-based authentication, JWT, or OAuth for the REST web service without affecting the current bi basic authentication mechanism for the web application? So what you will have to do is first, to implement JWT and OAuth, uh, the best option would be to use something like a key cloak. So there is a related question later and um, without affecting the current basic authentication. So the current basic authentication, uh, what a server does, the server is responsible for decoding um, the, uh, the username and password and mapping into principles. And usually a server filter is responsible for JWT and OAuth. Um, I think what you will have to do, you will have to modify the JWT filter in that way that it doesn't react or doesn't authenticate the user in case there is a basic authentication in place. So this is what you will have to do. It sounds easy to me, so I never did it, but uh, it seems um, I don't see any problems right now. So you will probably you know, look at the header and say, if the header contains base64 encoded, uh, I forgot actually what the name is, authorization header, I think, uh, then skip JWT and OAuth. Okay, so this is a very good one, and I'm really glad uh, uh, G or GAT asked me this. For production, what tool you use to profile your application? Of course, we will discuss it uh, in, the, in the monitoring uh, workshop the whole day, but um, what I did recently, uh, I created, uh, wait a second, uh, GitHub, github.com. Exactly, Firehose. So what I implemented, I um, actually will record a screencast, uh, probably even right after the show. It really depends how, how long does it take. But um, so what this actually is, it, um, it, it is a gateway or a mapper. So it access whatever endpoint you have by um, adjacent endpoint. And the Firehose is a war, a thin war, 60K. Um, and... It accesses uh, metrics and ex re-exposes the metrics in Prometheus format. So what the hell is Prometheus? Prometheus is a great uh, uh, tool written, I think, in Go, not in Java, but nonetheless a really great, great tool with um, pretty statistics. So let's see, visualization. It comes with Grafana, and it really looks pretty. 
and it basically it is a time series database, very efficient one, and one uh, Prometheus server is able, you know, to handle multiple hundred of servers. And the idea is here: the Prometheus will talk to Firehose, get you know Prometheus, uh, Prometheus ready metrics, and the Firehose will access your metrics in whatever format uh, available. Right now, it um, a little bit uh, limited. So what it does, it access the metrics. Let's see. So I have uh, an example for you. So I implemented a sample service. And the sample service just um, exposes business metrics. So application, sample service, component, matrix resource, units, requests, and so forth. And this application, component, units, and suffix are best practices from Prometheus. So at least you will have to, 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 um, to, uh, to, to provide a value, and value is your value. This kit can be whatever, number of requests, number of orders, number of transactions, whatever you like. And Firehose will connect to your microservice and expose, re-expose the metrics in Prometheus format so this is what you will have to do and i'm i suggest you do this so what it means whatever your application is doing it's doing something valuable and this has to be monitored number of you know sold tickets number of uh book orders number of whatever so like a business matrix or or um, a, some sometimes i call it key performance it's called key performance indicators kpis um, so um, this is more valuable than tracking, you know, whatever. And what do you get for free on Epic? Um, you get for free uh, through, let's see, can I kill that? Yeah. And then let's start the Payara here. So um, what do you get for free? You will get um, the, uh, the application server matrix. So let's see whether it already started. And these are, of course, technical metrics. And I wrote, so this is server, and you will be able to monitor, let's say, transaction service, number of commits, number of rollbacks. So you get this for free, and you get this as JSON, for instance. You get this as XML. And all application servers I know provide you the statistics. And uh, Payara is pretty good with that. So you get uh, transactions, uh, applications, you get uh, the network, you know, file cache, connection queue, uh, thread pools, uh, lots of interesting stuff. Um, so you get it for free. So you get the technical information for free. If you deploy EGBs, they are all also going to be re-exposed um, uh, with metrics. So if you're interested, uh, go to the uh, microservice uh, workshop, uh, microserv Java e microservices, the online workshop. So I did it all uh, as well. And uh, But this is, you know, somehow useful. What's really important is that you will create your own business matrix and expose the matrix in an accessible format. And I don't think it can be automatically created for you, regardless with what tool you, you are using, because usually what these tools are doing, they are just exposing methods of boundaries, and probably they associate even methods to a SQL statements. But what I would really like to, to, to see my projects again, you know, Number of sold workshops, not number of uh, you know uh, fraud attempts or whatever. This is what what really matters. And, and Prometheus with uh, Firehose uh, is a great combo. You could of course use um, a Prometheus code with own um, library, but uh, you will have to include lots of dependencies. I don't like this, so I'm I just like uh, Thin Wars. So uh, and with the Firehose, you don't need any dependency. Of course, so it's very Javaistic <laughs> solution. Okay. So uh, this seems to work. There were some questions. OK, thank you, Dino, that you like uh, uh, real-time air hacks. And uh, so the chat is quiet today, except, oh man, NSYPXD5BGV1. Hi, Adam. Good evening. So good evening, BG1. Cool. So we covered even Firehorse. And um, I will cover it. I will record a screencast to show you this is how it works in action. Okay, so we have that matrix. And the next one. Good one. Do you know? Ask me. Question about Java security injected the entity manager. So um, 
what I understood is the following. Uh, Dino would like to inject entity managers depending on something, so like a multi-tenant solution, and uh, how to do this. So we did something similar in, uh, in a project, um, and uh, what you will have to do is, so our problem was like we had several, let's say, uh, countries or systems, and depending on the user, we had to, cho to choose the entity manager on the fly. And what uh, we did, it was uh, we just injected all the known entity managers from different persistence unit into a CDI bean, and then exposed the entity manager based on some, how to say, properties of the user, depending on country, language, or whatever. So you can do it dynamically, or you can do it statically. So if if you can, I would do it statically. Because, uh, yeah, it's no less magic. So just inject whatever you can into CDI, all entity managers, and I guess you don't get, you know, multiple hundreds persistence units. It's like, in our case, there were like five. So you inject the five entity managers, and then in a method called, you know, expose entity manager with producers, depending on user properties, so you will have to re-expose the user somewhere. So um, uh, if you know you know the language or whatever, so you can, for instance, inject principle, and depending on the principle, you could look up with the principle name some additional properties, and depending on the properties, uh, then inject inject the proper entity manager. I think th that's all. So this is a, this was actually pretty trivial, and I hope uh, it's also trivial in your case. Okay. This is a good one. So, Jerson uh, from Ecuador, crazy. So, I would like to elaborate the options, pros and cons we have to implement service discovery in Java 7 microservices architecture project. So, I think I'm glad that everyone, um, uh, everyone, also everyone, at least at AirHexDV, chosen Java 7 for microservices. What I'm curious, what are your experiences? And, by the way, if you would like to be interviewed on my blog about your Java 7 experiences of microservices, drop me a tweet, uh, whatever, and uh, I will send you the questions. You will answer the question and we will publish on my blog. Um, why I'm interested in doing this? Because I get lots of questions to know who uses Java 7 or Java 7 is too heavyweight for whatever. So there's still lots of esoterics and, you know, cargo cult out there. So, but I get the questions all the time, you know, which discovery service I use in my projects. Even today on my client, I got the same question. And last week as well. So, um, and I have to admit so far, none of them. And why not? Because we start, you know, low with just Docker and then sometimes Docker Swarm. And what Docker already does, it already finds all the instances. So what you get on top of that with, uh, with uh, service discovery, you will be able to discover you know, multiple servers and multiple versions at the same time is more like, you know, like um, core bar registries or even more, more flexible. But uh, if the flexibility of Java E doesn't, you know, uh, uh, is not enough, what usually happens, my clients uh, use something like OpenShift, for instance. What OpenShift does is like open source solution which comprises HR proxy, etcd, uh, Kubernetes, and Docker. And you will set up your service and then expose your service via an endpoint. And the endpoint is visible to the outside world with uh, via a DNS service. And you get a uh, kind of service registry in OpenShift. So um, I would ask you first why you need a service registry. Because I only know one case where we decided to use the service registry. And the case was we bought external service. And because of business reasons, the service had need to be you know, swapped in real time. And we built uh, some indirection to be able to do this. But uh, this was absolute uh, exception from the rule. And it was two years ago. Since then, we just keep it simple. I hope I answered your question. If not, please re-ask the question at the 38th <laughs> AXTV. But be more specific. So what you would like to solve? with a service registry, and I think I will, will find an answer. But by the way, Snoopy is really nice. So um, I forgot the guy who built Snoopy. Ah, Ivar Grimstad, this is his name. Um, and Snoopy is great, so if you... I would prefer Snoopy o over Zookeeper. Zookeeper is more like, uh, for instance, in Kafka, it is more like uh, election of a singleton. 
more like this. And yeah, and, and a distributed database, which actually is used to elect a singleton. So, and Snoopy is more like a service registry. So I will prefer Snoopy because it's, of course, war and Java E. Okay. Tomcat failed, no problem. We don't need Tomcat right now. So no questions here. No questions here. Lots of questions here. So the next one. So um, I have to say, everyone thanks me for sharing, but uh, to be honest, I do the AHEX TV to save time. So I, uh, I stopped to, to answer technical emails, which is a great time saver, and I really enjoyed AHEX TV. So I actually, with AHEX TV, I share less than before. So, <laughs> But uh, thank you for watching. So um, next one. Uh, he asked me... So he likes uh, the this mapping uh, JSON to entities, and the question is you now how to do the uh, link mapping. And um, so if you go to search for Chuxeras link, so the only way I know is like this. This is the official uh, Chuxeras way. You can see link from URI, and you can map the link here, and it will appear as a link. So you get this for free. I mean, it's not a lot, but at least something. So in in, in uh, this is um, yeah, and so there is a class Java X W S R S Core Link. So this is the direct uh, answer to your question. And um, the question I know is um, what HTOS is. It is a acronym which I can remember. Is uh, Hyper Engine as the application state of something so and um, it is like a little bit extreme way of for jack's arrest but also a nice one it means the uh, the services fully describe themselves and i don't believe that machines uh, will read the services and invoke it in real time but what i believe is uh, it is really useful in case you would like to make your api self-descriptive and this is the pointer here, image URL, and he would like to serialize the image URL here. And the question is how to do this. This is a similar problem to injection of entity managers. So inside the entity, you don't have the access to the URI builder, exactly. And so we'll have to pass it. Uh, which options do you have? Of course, you can try to store it in a thread local, so it will work. Um, so you can uh, you can you can get a reference in uh, in the Jaxers resource, put it to thread local, which I discourage. I don't like it, but uh, it would work. Um, or of course, if you know you know what your URI is, you could just hard code this. Or of course, build your own uh, solution with uh, with uh, annotations. Um, it's hard to say. So I would say uh, the thread local is a pragmatic solution. So what you did is even more pragmatic. And uh, it's not that bad because um, this to JSON is properly invoked in JaxOS anyway, so you can always pass uh, pass the URI builder. So this would be even, I think, the, the simplest possible solution. So I think this way I would start with that and see, you know, how many links do you actually have here. And um, what you can s s look at um, for inspiration is Eclipse link, JPA REST, for instance, there is a subred which implements, um, which maps JPA entities to, let's see, to rest. And this was, this is not that bad. Hmm. Yeah, it, it will look like this, but it happens automatically. So you look for Eclipse Link and Jack's Rest, so they have really nice... And it was called Jest in OpenJPA, I think. Something similar. So uh, this is similar, so they automatically map JP entities to REST. But uh, uh, the uh, Eclipse link example, this is why I found something something different. Um, Eclipse link REST. This 
is still an example how to build REST apps. This could be RESTful data services. Exactly, this is what I meant. So we found this. So I would make it a little bit larger. It looks like get persistence version unit name entity type ID. And what will happen, um, you will get all the relationships. So take a look at this. It could be useful, at least at the source code, how, how it's implemented. So it could be useful for your needs. So you can just traverse all the relationships for free. And this is basically a servlet. Uh, it's a very old one, a solution which comes out of the box with Eclipse Link. So you have to search for RESTful data services and Eclipse Link, and you will find that. Cool. Questions? No questions? Also no questions? Yeah. Then, next one. Also a nice one. Uh, Joe Yuki asked me... Um, He's working for Java e for four years using JSF, JPA, PrimeVase, a little bit of REST. What do you recommend me to study to improve my career? Um, as there are tons of subject, I got lost every time. So I think what hmm, the solution to, to the problem was uh, Java e in my case. Because uh, yeah, without Java E, I would also get lost. So with Java E, there's a clear path; it's the standard. So I only learn Java E and then know how to build, you know, server-side applications. The same what I'm doing right now, you know, I uh, uh, I do a lot of HTML5, but I try to avoid frameworks. Just go straight um, straight uh, HTML. DOM uh, recent DOM manipulations is uh, pretty powerful. Standard CSS and standard ECMAScript uh, six or even seven. And I can ignore lots of frameworks but uh, and, and rely on standards. So we have JCP on the one hand and W3C on the other hand. This is my way, you know, to, 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 to remain focused. And um, thinking about this, uh, I think for years, none of my clients ask me actually about Java E. They ask me about solutions or they have problems, applications are too complicated. And I could actually, you know, migrate the application whenever I like, which I don't didn't did this so what i did is uh, just simplify the applications and i think uh, what you should focus more is on solution not a specific technology you know jpa jsf prime phases can 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 come and go so that the next bus is around the corner and you are working for four years with java e if you will wait let's say additional two years you will find a pattern so the whole technology will repeat with different name. So, um, for instance, uh, the lambdas, Amazon lambdas, and function as a service really remind me uh, of um, remote EG, remote entity beans we got, you know, 15 years ago, where there was an attempt, you know, to invoke fine-grained functions over the network and hope it will scale better and uh, is a higher use. So uh, what happened then? A few years later. It didn't work, so uh, the entity beans became local, and the session facade encapsulates encapsulated the entity beans. But from technology perspective, you will find patterns. Okay, we had it already. Why it didn't work? Why it worked? What was good? What was bad? So you you will learn faster and faster. So focus on concepts, not APIs. This would be my suggestion to you, and. Um, and you will have to enjoy to learn. I think the the the, the only thing which matters in our time is um, really like to learn and play with things. Yeah, this is what I suggest to you. Okay. Cool. Apache Olingo. I don't know Apache Olingo. So I will have to look Apache Olingo. So Apache Olingo. Cool, OData. Uh, OData is uh, is a self-descriptive format, I think, was uh, defined by uh, start Microsoft started with that. Uh, so it looks uh, interesting. So even better, this Eclipse link was, uh, you know, uh, Eclipse specific. But this is even better because this omits OData protocol. So uh, thank you, Manuel. So um, this is actually really nice. I didn't knew Ol Olinga. I will look at this. Uh, uh, looks interesting. So lots of stuff happens actually at Apache right now. Jakarta is dead, but uh, lots of Java projects started at Apache without mentioning Java. So it's interesting. So next one. What solution are you using for mobile applications in your projects? 
actually I try to um, I really like Angular 1 uh, I think Angular 2 is or 4 because there will be no 3 is a bit of exaggerated my personal opinion and it really reminds me to you know uh, cargo culted Java e app with lots of injection and modules uh, without any conventions and lots of configuration this is what I think personally think if I see Angular code it's like oh yeah it's a crazy Java e architects implementing UI so uh, what I do in my projects I use uh, for simple apps nothing just uh, just uh, vanilla HTML5 JavaScript and CSS this is what I actually do at the first day in the web standards uh, workshop at Munich Airport uh, in um, sometimes uh, React, um, uh, this is React from Facebook, and uh, several projects right now with web components and Polymer 2.0. So I didn't like 1.0 because of strange syntax, but 2.0. But he asked me about native mobile app. About native mobile app, I would suggest uh, look at React Native. Uh, this is really interesting solution. Uh, so React Native, what also interesting is Native Script is the name. And if you, um, yeah, I wouldn't use Cordova uh, because Cordova is more like browser wrapper and uh, React Native is a truly, truly native app. Cool. So let's close Olingo. So you see additional, uh, additional homework for me, evaluate Olingo. Okay, so this is a good one. So what's the deal? Why we need this context resolver? And what context resolver is, um, you can you can register it pragmatically with JaxRS or provide it in boots. And what you can do, you can add additional something to this. And and uh, what is the something usually the use for JaxP? For instance, if you would like to install um, Jackson, you usually do it with context resolver. What you could do in your projects, not a lot is a project, but if you're building products, you could register your implementation in context resolver and fetch them later. So you can pass, for instance, uh, get context with the type. Um, and what you get back is what you registered. It's like registry or replacement of producers and in add inject. Uh, so keep in mind, JaxRS can be used without CDI. And with Context Resolver, you can, at boot time, you know, initi initiate something, initialize something, and later fetch it. Okay. So, I hope we did this. Um, hard to me, because... <laughs> What happens in code reviews, uh, I don't know why, but lots of projects are using uh, lots of web XML and uh, configured um, epic, uh, uh, JaxRS configured classes. So with, I don't know, they configure singletons, uh, paths or whatever. And I just delete everything. So um, I have to, to admit, I never used Context Resolver in my projects. Uh, I actually thought to write a blog post, you know, how to use Context Resolver, but I couldn't give you any useful example because I'm not implementing the application server, I'm just using them. So, yeah. Also a good one. So ask me you now, I used uh, REST to call between microservices using the name of the container. But in ECS, this is uh, Elastic Com Container Service from Amazon or Gelastic. I have a load balancer and multiple containers. What is the name that I should use? How I can I refer to this balancer? Fine enough, we did it today with a client um, so of my so we had, uh, I wanted to load balance uh, two wars, or just not, I wanted, the client wanted to load balance two wars. And what you would do, you would launch uh, the wars with name like you no know, war one or M microservice one and microservice two, like you no know, order service one, order service two. And the name of the load balancer is just order service. This is the my way of dealing with that. And if other microservice would like call the order service, it should go through the order service name and not the order service one or order service two. Also great, uh, so um, in the 34th AirHex QA, uh, he asked me about CMT and I answered with transactional and Sergio was happy with the answer, which is good. So, and now here I say, um, this is was very useful for me, but how it is implemented JTA transaction at the hood? Actually simpler than you think. Uh, so first, 
it can be implemented differently on, on, on whatever application server you have. But usually, a JTA transaction is just tied to a execution thread. So whatever is executed synchronously, it is transactional. And if you look at the entity manager, the entity manager, I think the entity manager has a method and list. Entity manager and list should be the method name. Uh, or I thought it was. And with the end list method, this is like looks a little bit complicated here. Lots of annotations. But uh, the entity manager or entity manager factory enlists itself in transaction. So um, if the entity manager um, recognizes is it is uh, running in a in a transactional context, it enlists itself in a transaction. Say, hey, I'm I'm really interested in the tra transaction. So think about of a JTA transaction context as a execution thread. So like a boolean boolean flag, I am transactional. And actually look at the spec. And in one place, they even suggest that the uh, transactional context is stored in a thread local. So I, I, I guess most of the application servers will use thread local to store the transaction context. Actually, I wanted to look at the source code from Payara or Tommy, but I didn't. There was a crazy time. I don't know what happens this year. L lots of requests of Java E uh, and uh, microservice. Actually, I even had to cancel a Java Land conference. So I'm uh, really sad, but uh, <laughs> uh, I just couldn't handle the workload. Um, I don't know what happens. Crazy times. So um, probably Java E gets more and more popular. So we have. Um, so think about uh, of JTA transactions as something which is. Uh, which is associated with the execution thread. You see, entity manager factory and lists. So, and this is the book for Monsieur Rubinger. And the method, very good. This is a, a good guy. Bill Burke is a no uh, old Corba rest guy from from Whitefly. Andy Lou, Lee Rubinger is the. Um, CDI and uh, Archelian, and it's not enlist, it is joint transaction. And you see, um, and th then it joins the transaction. So it's not enlist, the method was called joint transaction. So uh, look at entity manager joint transaction, and uh, if you can create a breakpoint, and then you can trace who invokes that, and then you will see what the application servers are doing. And if you like, drop a note on the next AHX TV show. So now we could include your investigation. And by the way, the Bitronics and, and JOTM, I look at them, they really look interesting, but I don't know what the use case actually is. It looks like they try to make JT or Tomcat transactional, but the question is, if I would like to run transactions on Tomcat, I would use Tommy. But um, I would be curious to know what is actually the, the, the use case on when it is used, the JOTM or Bitronics. So, um, can you tell us what changes security we can expect to see Java E8 in JSR 3.7.5? Of course, uh, Zotaria, GitHub, JSR and 3.7.5. And by the way, I, I am an expert group member, but a very lazy one. So actually, I broke my wrist, I think it was two years ago, and uh, this, the, this Java spec started so um i had to to cancel some projects and i hacked like crazy some uh some samples and then uh, became quiet because of workload but uh, what you can do go to the test and there are lots of um lots of uh implementations of of uh, or implementation use cases what you can see right now and um, there is an LDAP, Juxor uh, customization. So it is completely different and, and a way easier to use the new security. And the cool story is already it even already runs on Java EE7. On Payara, Web Liberty, and Whitefly, there are some problems with WebLogic, but all other application servers are running well. Um, yeah, and WebLogic will have to come, of course, with support one day because uh, yeah, it's Oracle. And Oracle also pushes Java 8 in Java EE. Uh, nine. So um, look at this. 
it is uh, fairly easy to use. There are different realms with uh, sessions and uh, whatever. So just, uh, yeah, and you see there's already Milestone 3 and uh, it worked even two years ago. Okay, cool. Very good one. This friendly looking guy <laughs> uh, says, okay, he would like to uh, migrate Java E from web application server to JBoss ERP Docker environment, OpenShift is a good one. OpenShift is really nice. And um, and was a nice uh, Java Thin Wars um, relates to Java Thin Wars as well. How I called uh, uh, wars without any dependencies. I was like, okay, what to do with that? Spring secur security seems more flexible and forward than Java security. Yeah, but very similar to JSR 375. So look at that. So we had it. Spring Batch. And JSR352 is like Spring Batch. Yes, it was, of course, created by IBM and Spring guys, so it has to be similar. And um, the nice story with uh, with Batch, not Spring Batch, many applications use Batch uh, or, or, or use Batch frameworks without require the Batch frameworks, actually. Um, in most cases, they just periodically start something without lots of, uh, you know, there's no checkpoints, no redo, no nothing. And then you don't need a whole framework. So I will first check, do you really need a batch functionality or just you would like to start jobs in the background? Uh, Java 8 and Java API in Spring, this works out of the box. This is what, I don't know what it, what it means because I think you relate to JPA. So, and uh, JPA comes with this type converters. So you will have to write one class to make it work. And probably Spring brings already the converter with Spring. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. For JPA, Jack Suarez, Jack Spay, and JSF. Uh, will Java E8 bring full support for this Java 8 types? I'm I'm not sure about JPA. For the others, it should. Okay. Uh, and Jax B is actually not a part of uh, Java EE7 rather than Java SE and um, yeah, but I mean, Spring doesn't come with own JPA implementation. So uh, what you could do, you can just take the Spring converter, if you like. So there's Apache license, should work. Um, what are your thoughts on, on these? So evaluate what you really need. This will be JSR375. Spring batch, evaluate, you really need batches or uh, it's just, you know, someone like just batch frameworks. And... Uh, I'm not sure whether I will use this JSR352 because uh, in my projects, this is this J neither JSR352 nor Spring Batch are very popular. So it seems like it's not used a lot. If there is not used a lot, I would expect bugs. So um, the question is, you know, yeah. Uh, just, you know, evaluate how much of the framework you're actually using. Okay. And this is what we always do if we migrate from some somewhere to to to, <laughs> to somewhere. The, the most interesting question is, you know, um, how much of the functionality is actually used and what we can delete. This is the very first one. So whatever you can delete, you don't have to migrate. <laughs> this is the rule of Java E, migrations. Whatever you can delete, it doesn't have to be migrated. Um, yeah, what I did, um, it seems like this was also funny. So I got a email from... Uh, a project in Sweden and, and sometimes I do workshops for them and they ask me, okay, uh, what is my opinion about DTOs? So I wrote the blog post, what I do with DTOs, like I have an entities and they have a constructor with JSON object and two DTO. And it seems like many people picked it up and this uh, uh, becomes more and more popular, which is really nice. It works still good in my projects. And what I also did in one of my screencasts, I created a uh, input validator for, uh, sorry, bin validator for JSON. So if you go to the YouTube channel, you will find that. And he asked me, what about the declarative approach? So, well, if you think about this, the JSON object is a hash map. So it would be fairly easy to enhance my solution to be declarative. Uh, so we could use dot notation, whatever, or we can add, add, add additional parameter annotations like not null, greater than, whatever, and they could refer to the contents of the hash map. So it would be extremely easy to do this. Um, 
I don't even know whether I should implement this as an example, or uh, or 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 I could the easiest the time save it would be to to record a screencast. So if you're interested in it, ping me. I will write or I will create a screencast with a suggestion. You know how to implement declarative input validation with JSON objects. Cool. So let's see what happens here. So the uh, chat is extremely quiet. A perfect team. Manuel is a very eager, eager, and I think I know Manuel. It's a great project with uh, something with farming, I guess. So they also use Java Air Crazy, uh, smart guys. Very interesting. I interviewed Manuel on my blog. So if you search for uh, Next Farming on my blog, you will find Manuel. A interesting Java startup, I would say. Okay. So, Monsieur Souls. David, I think I know him from Twitter. So, and this is microservice theory says. So, um, first, I would say, who cares about any theory? So, there are lots of theories, and most of the theories are very dogmatic. And if you if and if you follow something in very dogmatic way, you always will fail. I think th theories work well for seventy or eighty percent of all cases, and then they just you know fail miserably. So, first. Uh, you are right, so this is the theory, one microservice per database. The question is, why we have this theory? No, there is a theory, so what is the, the idea behind? And the idea behind such a thing is that um, you could, of course, evolve the microservice one independently from microservice two. And um, so is it is it easy? No, it is very hard. And um, unless you know the business logic very well. What you could do then, you could say, okay, this microservice here, uh, contains a copy of data of from microservice here, and this copy is the right way to go. So what it would mean, for instance, I don't know, I uh, I have here, let's say, uh, stock of uh, products, and I can delete the products, and I can uh, add new products, and this would be the orders. So what you could do, I could just you know copy the products here. So if the product is deleted here, I don't get you know null pointer reference between the microservices, for instance. So and this is more like all microservices can share a common database, and this is what usually happens in migration projects. No one is able usually to split the database co completely. This is really hard, and and I would start with that. And uh, after the refactoring, if you split the monolith to microservices, then you know a little bit more about the business logic, and then you could try. To attempt, you know, to split the database. Okay. Uh, crazy, how many? So I think during <laughs> during I'm talking, you you are filing the the questions. So um, this is a conference attendee. It was at the if you look at the talk from the CERN conference, at the end we had uh, a funny fight with an attendee who asked me some questions. It was a really nice guy. And he wrote me a mail, but I lost the mail, so I just remember the the question. And he said, "Okay, what do we do? We move away from Java E and we move away from Spring to plain Java SE. And is it viable? Absolutely. So I mean, if you can live with that, just do this. For instance, a project uh, GitHub, and it's called Nhydrate." So this project is like ETL tool. I actually was hired by the company to implement for them um, JSR 352 batch solutions, or we are by the topic right now. And I look at this and say, okay, this looks nice, but you don't really need a batch. What you just need is a flexible solution to, you know, read the business object from one service, convert them and write them to another service, and you don't even need Java E. So what it did, I implement this uh, anhydrator, and it comes with Java 8 without any external dependencies, I think. So uh, let's take a look. It, there should be no de external dependencies. Uh, okay, this is test, test, test. So we have JSON, but there is no Java, it's just test dependencies, and anything else is just for releasing. So there are no external dependencies, so it's not depending on anything. But uh, my client asked me to write, you know, Java EE7 back then service. 
So uh, we could also now create an own HTTP server without Java E, but I think which starts a little bit more problematic. So if you have, uh, you know, JAXOS, uh, it's already nice, and then you will, uh, if you if you are already in JAXOS, you probably would like to have a dependency injection. So you would like to use CDI, and then you would like to have, you know, a little bit of monitoring. So you will need an, an application server probably in one point. And you know it would be also nice to start threads and, and configure a thread, so you would use you know concurrency utilities. And if you would like to read the database um, or you would like to read the configuration from database, uh, JPA is nice for that. So you need JPA, and one point of time you have everything, and implement this by hand with Java SE, then it I think it would be a fa far more complicated or or just noisier than Java e seven. So I'm absolutely with the attendee. I would start with always start with plain Java 8 and Java 9, and uh, if it uh, if it um, is too much, then I will just migrate to Java 7. But sometimes I already know, you know, it doesn't work out, so I just start with straight with Java 7 and and soon with Java EE 8. So it's not like everything has to be Java EE 7 or 8. Some things can be just Java SE. And um, also, what we do sometimes, also also interesting, sometimes we wrap, you know, trivial logic with application servers, just to um, to to have, you know, the uh, the um, CLI and the monitoring tools is a lot easier to wrap, you know, to start the application server with a simple batch service, and you can monitor the batch service easier than just on plain Java SE8. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the overhead of application servers is pretty low, so it really does not matter. Okay. Uh, next question. So uh, Angular, maybe with Prime and G, is like uh, components. This is um, Prime faces components without the backend, just HTML5. Um, and now the question is: all, all in a single war, or have two project, one for backend and other project with Angular stuff? So usually the latter. What 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 happens in my project is the following: and the first iterations, um, both are shipped at once. And what happens then is then the back end is more stable than the front end and you know i don't like to redeploy everything just because css or html changes so i think it it um it is it comes with uh with um some advantages to have two wars one for the front end and one for the back end on the other other way if you and on the other hand if you find yourself you know to to always touch two wars then it doesn't make any sense to have two wars, then put everything in one war. Also, if you have two wars, you have to play with cores a little bit, and you you find yourself, you know, to to, to ask yourself uh, about the URI, where the first war knows where the second war lives. Of course, we have wars. We could trick with JSPs or servlets, so you will find a way. But if you have if you are in one war, everything is loaded from one location. So what you could do even start with one war. And then see what happens if uh, if your uh, backend or restful services st st stabilize or are more stable than the front end, uh, then you can split this. And if everything change equally often, then and then keep one war and redeploy everything. So and I don't know Maven plugins. I don't like Maven plugins. What I use for automation, I use npm because yeah, it's a lot easier and standard. So Audam, also nice a typo. With Java and high performance IoT applications. So actually, we had some attendees in the last uh, air hacks in Munich Airport. Uh, I mean, Java was also fast enough, and almost yeah, most of my project right now are IoT project. What it means is a, a hardware which has TCP/IP connection and and talks to us. So we are we are able to have you know several thousand transactions per second. This is this just the usual performance. Tips, tricks, most used NoSQL databases are tips, tricks, always the same, just perform uh, perform stress tests frequently, night runs, measure the performance, pre-major optimization, root of all evil, measure first, then optimize. And most used NoSQL databases really de depends on use case, but Elasticsearch, Cassandra, that's what I will look first. Uh, Elastic, but you cannot compare NoSQL to, to uh, mm -hmm. or Cassandra to, to uh, Elasticsearch, but this is what I used recently, for instance. Postgres, also nice, has also um, NoSQL extensions. Okay, 
be more specific because IoT. So one client uh, wanted to, uh, they asked me, you know, what about IoT? So I go, okay, what do you mean by IoT? Everything is IoT. If you have REST endpoint, whether I'm invoked by a bulb or whatever, doesn't matter, right? Um, sometimes um, uh, the uh, the hardware require us for specific protocols. Then you have, of course, to choose them. So what what happens then? We have like a protocol adapter sitting with application servers, which talk with the proprietary protocol and translate the calls to REST calls. And in some project we use MQTT because we are forced to use MQTT. Okay. Next one. Valnixta asked me, uh, I want to secure my REST with JE Keycloak. And uh, Keycloak comes with uh, with uh, filters, but doesn't come with uh, you know tight integration with Payara. So if you would like to be integrated tightly with Payara, you have to look at OpenIM from Forge Rock. It comes with tight Payara integration. Is that? So this is tight Payara integration and Glassfish and Keycloak is more tight Whitefly integration. Both can be used for both application servers, but Keycloak is more suitable for you know, loser integration. So it comes with servlet filter and JAXRS requests filter, I think. And this is more suitable for Payara. Of course, you can write your adapter by yourself, or you can look at the implementation. This is also open source of OpenAM and then adapt it to Keycloak. This is just what, what you can do. And the very last one. So it is the following. And this is a student, very nice one. And uh, so if you can help him. So what I understood, I, I read this several times, but he creates uh, uh, several entities. It works with entity image request filter. That's what I don't get why you need the request filter. And he would like to create a war. So I think the problem, the first problem is you have probably in multiple jars or whatever uh, with a time microservice that tells time to develop and test the SDK with. So we have, so I actually don't get the problem, but what I can tell you is the following. If you put everything to a war, it will work. If you put a jar to a war and in the jar is a bin XML, it will also work. If you put a jar to a war and in a jar is persistence XML, it may work. Uh, because what what you can do in uh, in persistence XML, you can point to an external jar which contains JPA entities. I think it's called jar file. There is one tag jar file. And if you need an example, go to GitHub. Adam Bean and Porcupine. This is a small library. Porcupine. Pine. And what Porcupine is, it comes as a jar, and you can include the jar as a dependency to your JAXRS, and it integrates, uh, uh, it makes itself available even for injection. So you can inject, you know, thread pools from Porcupine or throw this external jar. So just look at this, it works. So if you just include this Porcupine, it will work, make it injectable. Uh, if Porcupine will come with, um, with entities and persistence unit, it would should also work. So I never tried that, but it should also work. So look at this. This could help you, I think, with your issues, because for me, I don't get the problem. So th this problem means uh, it it uh, the entity is not listed. What what can happen is that um, if you have persistence XML, there is um, there is um, a tag like exclude entities, and if you if you deploy a solution to application server, you don't have to list the entities. But if you use integration tests, then you have to list all the entities. So what you can what could also help you is the following. So if you go start a Maven project new from archetype. And you search for air hacks. Uh, this essentially is what I you know create always in in my screencast. But this one could be interesting to you. 
interesting to you. This is like um, a sample project with integration tests, system tests, and unit tests. And what I did here, you will find two kinds of persistence XML. One is meant to start it in integration tests, so with listing all the entities, and the other one is meant to be used on application server without the entities, and both are working. So just take a look at this. This could be interesting to you. Okay. We are done. Questions here? Okay, he is using the request filter. The, oh, authentication authorization. Okay, then it should work. Uh, and I think we are done. So there is no questions. So see you tomorrow in Munich at the uh, Munich airport. So we start with the architecture, prepare questions. And um, we are actually pretty fast. What I think I will do, I will record the um, Firehose screencast, just briefly how it works. And uh, so thank you for watching. Prepare your questions. See you next month. And and I will try to uh, to publish it this week, uh, the, the screencasts. And yeah, see your upcoming workshops, of course, Munich Airports. And um, yeah, and I'm working with something exciting uh, for the online course. So um, thank you for watching and bye.